making a movie physically and mentally destroys you. You know, it just, it just does. It becomes such a labor of love that sometimes we neglect to look at it as a business. People lock into this idea that there is a correct way to do things. There's not. There's a million ways to do it. Video has become the most effective way to get people to do something that it is you want them to do. It's time for filmmakers to get real with Jeffrey Michael Bayes and Forrest Day Jr. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, We're continuing to follow this breaking news. Uh, This is kind of an addition to our last broadcast. We've been reporting on this distributor story that distributor has apparently closed and is still not releasing anything official to the public, but they are secretly working with filmmakers to take their films down if they request it. Hmm. We have a uh, kind of a sleuth a journalist type of documentarian. His name is Jeff Weitzman, and he's just a filmmaker with a film just like the rest of us and decided to do some digging and some calls, and he actually got a hold of somebody inside of the uh, it's the it's the uh, how do we how do we put it? So a bankruptcy lawyer. Right. A bankruptcy yeah. firm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is Glass Ratner is the name of the company, and they have they are now in charge of figuring out what to do, <laughs> and they're yeah. still doing the figuring, and, and apparently it's going to take nine months to figure all this out. And then we have Alex Ferrari of Indie Film Hustle who brought this to the forefront, who uh, we wouldn't be talking about distributor today and uh, what do they... Uh, appear to be doing or not doing uh, if he hadn't have uh, really pushed this on his podcast. So we will have Alex here and he's going to talk all about this and about the changing state of the aggregator business. But first, it's Jeff Weitzman joining us now. Before we get into this, um, just tell us a little bit about who you are and um, and where you are, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles, and I have a couple documentary films under my belt. Um, The first one I did a couple years ago is called Cancer Can Be Killed, and it's about natural ways of treating cancer that are having far more success than uh, traditional methods of chemo, radiation, and radical surgery. And then I made a second film about children that were being forced into chemotherapy unnecessarily. That's called Flipping the Script. And so your films are using Distribber? So the first film, Cancer Can Be Killed, I put up uh, with Distribber on iTunes and Google Play. But then I myself put my film on Amazon. And then I also put my film on Vimeo On Demand myself. So Distribber was really only my aggregator for iTunes and Google Play. And once I started working with them, you know, the office looked like a tornado had hit it. Um, (laughs) I could never get good answers from anybody I spoke with. A lot of them were very nice, but they were clearly um, not the type of people I wanted to be with. So I just, I took it as a learning experience and I said, well, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but at least I've got my films up and, you know, we'll see what happens. And then with my next film, Flipping the Script, I actually chose a different aggregator. I chose Bitmax. And I've been really happy with them. Okay, so the reason we want to talk to you is because uh, you've been posting on Facebook that you actually had a meeting with one of the lawyers. Uh, and what was the um, what was the name of the company that has has now taken over Distribber? Right. Um, so Go Digital owned Distribber. It's still owned by Distribber. I mean, by Go Digital. Right. But yeah. what happened was. Um, mid September, September 19th, actually, they, um, filed for restructuring, which in essence is a chapter seven bankruptcy and liquidation. And so there's a skeleton crew in the distributor office, wherever that is. I'm sure they're hiding that. <laughs> they don't want <laughs> anyone to know, but, um, there's a skeleton crew and they're, they're handling emails at a place called support at distributor.com. And so this firm, Glass Ratner, is in charge of 
processing this chapter seven bankruptcy. And I got to talk to, you know, one of their attorneys, a gentleman by the name of Seth Freeman, and he gave me the full scoop. So that's what I was able to do today. Okay. So what did you find out? It's, it's pretty straightforward. They do this with a lot of companies that go under. Now, having said that, there's still a lot of questions and there's still a lot of things that we who are with Distriber have to work out because they mismanage funds grossly. And, you know, right now what they're saying is they have no money. And so we're all going to get pennies on the dollar. And the reality is that if this goes before a judge, a judge can ha ask further questions and say, show us that you don't have any money. Show us that, you know, the owners of Go Digital didn't just hide this money somewhere else. So that that's the stuff that has to be worked out. But in terms of, you know, what I learned um, from Seth, um, they're, they're doing this. Basically, it's a Chapter 7 bankruptcy liquidation out of court. And um, the, the likelihood that, that those of us who have films through Distriber are going to get any revenue from the last three quarters is – is slim and we're going to get pennies on the dollar hmm. and what's happening right now is there is another company like a financial company that's an assignee that is going to have um all of the um uh accounting and they're going to distribute the money and um september 19th was the date that you know everything got cut off and they filed chapter seven and so they're no longer a part of it. All okay. the so what all you're the saying is that it has been decided uh, as of September 19th, yeah. they are closed and they have filed bankruptcy. Ex exactly. Okay. And it's an, it's an out of court restructuring. It's like a chapter seven liquid uh, bankruptcy liquidation. So um, there, at any rate, after September 19th, all the revenue that comes in, will go directly to the filmmakers. So, um, the, but this is only going to last nine to 10 months that there's an assignee that's handling business and sending out checks. So I was told by Seth that the only option we have as filmmakers is to email distributor, ask them to take our film down, and then we can go to another aggregator and you know, reload our film uh, to places like iTunes and Google Play. Um, I was hoping that we could just transfer all of our accounting and information from one aggregator to another, uh, but apparently um, that's not possible. Nevertheless, I sent my email to Distribur today and I asked them, can you, can you transfer this to my other aggregator? But um, we'll find out. And I said, if that's not possible, then please take my film down and I will re-upload it on another aggregator. Okay, so what you're saying is that we have about nine months to take the film down and find an alternative. And from what I'm hearing, um, they are actually complying with that. They are taking films down if you request it. That's correct. And then the other issue is for people who have hard drives with Distriber, um, you know, I got mine because I loaded this all up over about a year and a half ago. And so, um, I got my hard drive, but a lot of people did not get their hard drives back and they need them back. Okay. So I didn't realize that. So filmmakers actually sent hard drives, so they've got thousands of hard drives. Well, it, you know, it, it's really just the people over the last few months that have have oh, okay. films. So they might. So then, totally so once, happen. so once they upload the films, then they actually send the hard drives back as part of their standard procedure. Yeah, or they ask you to come pick them up, and oh, okay. I can't okay. pick mine up. But for all those people who do have hard drives with them, they're all locked up. They're in a safe place, and in time, they're going to. Um, you know, get everybody's address and uh, ship them back to them. And I believe it will be at the filmmaker's expense. Um, so uh, if anybody has any assets there, they can get them back. It will be mailed back to them. 
Okay, well, that's uh, that's certainly good news. At least at least we have some answers now. Uh, but my big question is, uh, <laughs> why didn't they tell us this? You know, why not release a you know a, a press release and explain this to people? Right, all good points. And and you know, for us as filmmakers, we're still asking the question: What is our recourse here? And can we get the attorney general of California involved? Can we get the FTC involved? The reason that they didn't give us this information is because they're trying to do this under cover of darkness Mm -hmm. because they don't want all of this huge amount of money to be taken from them. And, you know, they grossly mismanaged it. They traveled around Mm -hmm. multiple countries, you know, pitching Distriber and how great they were. And they spent a lot of money. And um, I'm sure they have some other assets that they don't want to lose. And so they're trying as best they can to keep this a secret. And um, <laughs> it's, it's going to be up to us, the filmmakers, because there's a lot of us, you know, there's probably 4,000 of us. Um, it's going to be up to us to pool together, uh, maybe find a class action attorney that will do something but um, gosh, I, it would be fantastic if we could get some of this, some subpoenas, and get some stuff revealed on you know what actually happened. So, how did you get access to this uh, this person inside of Glass Ratner? Well, I had been reading that Glass Ratner was indeed the the firm, and um, I just did some sleuthing and some phone calls and and talked to people and eventually found out that the gentleman handling it was in San Francisco and uh, I was lucky enough to get him on the phone and um, then lucky enough to connect with him today. And he sounded very friendly and, and actually like he, you know, this is his business to do restructuring, but he was horrified by the way um, filmmakers had been exploited. And in his words, the business model just doesn't make any sense He's like, what's in it for Distriber after the first like four or five thousand filmmakers? Like they're only going to be adding maybe 50 or 100 filmmakers a month after that, because now there's so many aggregators. How are they going to make their money? And so, you know, his idea was there, you know, this is a bad business model and it was doomed to fail. Now, that's not what filmmakers are saying on some of the message boards. You know, filmmakers are saying, hey, it's not that bad of a business model and they're still getting revenue every year. And you don't need that many people in an office to just do accounting. So is it really that bad of a business model? Because there's lots of other aggregators out there and they're doing fine. So it's really more a business model where you've got to be kind of lean and mean and distributor was not obviously lean and mean and they were recklessly spending our money. It's, it's, it's all so, so mysterious. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll throw another wrench in the gears here that one of the things distributor is trying to do is they're trying to sell their book of business to other aggregators so that they can solicit the filmmakers to, um, join their company. It's just another way of bringing revenue in so they can pay filmmakers more of the money that they deserve. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure about the ethics of that, but <laughs> I'm not sure if we have any privacy in that matter, but, um, that's one of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to raise money and they're trying to do it by selling all the, the, um, our accounts, not, not really our accounts, but our information so we can be contacted and, um, Oh, I see. And, and sold, you know, Mm -hmm. their company. Well, thanks for digging into this. Um, some fascinating information that you, that you were able to get just by, uh, contacting the right person. It sounds like. Yeah. And, and, um, it's, uh, his, his words were, you know, right now we're, in this accounting phase. And he said their accounting was so horrible that we have a lot of work to do just, just to get all the figures together. So that's why it's going to take nine to 10 months to sort this all out. And hopefully at that time we'll have, 
you know, a, a deeper picture of exactly what we'll be making. And, um, so we'll see. So there you have it. That's Jeff Weitzman, a filmmaker, documentarian, um, really doing some research there and, uh, just happened to get a hold of, um, the man in charge, uh, apparently of disturber now telling us that yes, they are going bankrupt. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, it kind of sounds like uh, if you have a film uh, still with Distribber, it's time to take it down. Yeah, it sounds like they're trying to do the right thing. But when there's no money, there's no money to be had. But it sounds like they're trying to do what they can do to, um, you know, maybe so not as many people lose. But, uh, you know, a yeah. lot of people are still going to lose on this one. Yeah, sadly. Yeah. yeah. So that's that. And uh, let's talk to Alex Ferrari. He has been right in the middle of all of this. He has brought attention to this issue, and we probably wouldn't have known about it had Alex not uh, taken the initiative. And uh, really, uh, he ran with it, you know, on his podcast, Indie Film Hustle, and on Facebook. So um, the good news is, and we'll talk to Alex about this, is that he has now been successful in transferring his film from distributor to another distributor and his reviews have also been transferred that that's awesome that's that's a little ray of sunshine in this yeah. dark night it truly is because that that's what you work for when you have a film reviews are good for films and without them uh following over that that would be a real bummer especially because you put a lot of work into getting those reviews mm mm-hmm. mhm so this is this is good if the if the reviews are going to come over, you know, one little you know one little yeah. Yeah. one little sigh of relief, uh, you know, not 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 great but still something. Joining us now is Alex Ferrari of Indie Film Hustle and Indie Film Hustle TV. First of all, thanks for being on the show. And of course, we want to talk about Distributor today uh, because we're following this mm -hmm. kind of uh, unfolding news situation. But the big thing with you this week is that you actually have your film back up um, after it was pulled down. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Uh, so I, I I reached out to a friend of mine, uh, Linda Nelson and my, and Michael um, from uh, Indie Rights, and I well, you know they they've obviously been very close to the situation. And when I was pulling out, I I had already already partnered with them on my film on the corner of ego and desire, which is the, that film I shot at Sundance, which is coming out in January. So when this whole debacle started happening, I'm like, do you want this as Meg? And they said, absolutely. We'll take this as Megan and help you get it all, get it back. So what we did is I emailed them. I was one of the first, you know, I, I, I was the one that broke the story in regards to this stripper. I was the first Anybody in a, whatever public light that I might have, I was I was able to to raise some sort of noise about this, and I I was one of the first filmmakers to ask to get my movie pulled down because I when I found out what was going on, I instantly understood that I don't want to be with these people anymore, and it's going to take forever for me to get my movie back. I, I want to make money. I want to continue to make money with my film. So I had them pull it off. I was one of the first ones that got it pulled off immediately. So I got pulled off all of my all the platforms. And then I handed it over to Linda. I go, Linda, get it back up on Amazon for me. And she did. And uh, which we, we were still in the what's going to happen stage. Nobody had done it yet. So uh, it made sense that I was the first film to kind of go through the door again. And when I uh, when we put we put it back up, they pulled it down. We put it back up. No problems putting it back up. And then we poured it over the reviews fairly easily. So you did not lose the reviews or any of the ratings that you had uh, in the old the old model. The problem that we're seeing right now is, and this again, we just happened yesterday, I think. So right now, if you do a Google search for "This Is Meg," the first the first one that comes up is the old listing that has "Oh, this film is no longer available." So, but if you do a Google search on, or excuse me, if you do a search on Amazon. The the first movie that comes up is the new one. The other one I can't even find on Amazon, other than off Google. So if you do a search on that, so I think a search on 
Amazon, you won't find the old listing. If you do a search on Google, you will find the first listing and not even see the old, the new one yet. I think it's going to take some time to get everything updated, the algorithms to catch up with everything mm-hmm. else. So I give it a week or so before hopefully that works its way. It works its way out. But yes, so that's that was been that was some really great news. But having the reviews back, that's that's huge because that was a big issue for people. They weren't. Sure yeah, especially if your movie's there. up there yeah. forever. Yeah, if you yeah, if you have your movies up there forever and you've got 20, 30, 50, 100 reviews, if you put it back up, you got to kind of start from scratch again. So I think the platforms, you know, that and that wasn't a special thing that Linda did. That was just straight up customer service. Like, you know, she, she has because she does so much volume. She has a, a rep there, but she didn't even call them. She just did it normally through emails and stuff like that. And they just did it. No problem at all. So I think Amazon is slowly starting to figure out that there's a problem. <laughs> Jesus. And, uh, and we'll, find, we'll find out about the other platforms. You know, we'll know, I think, within 30 days about iTunes. Uh, but iTunes did accept it to go, to go back up on iTunes. So what that process is, I'll report back as soon as I know. But uh, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that I could be the guinea pig, I guess, to see <laughs> if we can make it work. That's awesome. So you're telling people it's time to take your film down from distributor. No more waiting you have to take it down, right? Absolutely. There's yeah. no question about it. From what we understand now, uh, that this this company is gone. It's 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 there. There's nobody there left. So now Glass Ratner, who is the the kind of bankruptcy, you know, reorganization company, is taking over everything technically, and they're redoing all their books and figuring things out and who's owed what and blah blah blah. And what's going to happen is they are going to probably file for Chapter Seven, which is liquidation. So then you will, if you owed, owed money, you will get pennies on the dollar, basically. So the new company that they're going to be putting into place, they're going to be putting in some sort of um, in like a, a temporary company to handle payments and things like that. So, But that's only going to be around for nine or 10 months, according to Glass Ratner. So it makes no sense whatsoever for you to keep your movie with the shriver, ever. And like, you got to pull it off right now. You know, and there, if you're holding on for dear hope that if, <laughs> oh, if I pull off, if I pull off my movie, then I'm not going to get my money. I'm like, you're not going to get your money. And there the was, money is gone. Yeah. And there was this idea last week um, that maybe even if you don't want to get paid, just keep your film up there just for the exposure. <laughs> is that-, that is some that is some BS. <laughs> Can I curse? Because that's yeah. some bullshit. <laughs> I mean, that is absolute. Whoever said that. I'm sorry. It is the worst advice you could give any filmmaker. That is like circa 2010 kind of thinking. That is not the current day world's thinking in regards to distribution, in regards to filmmakers generating revenue. In a world where you can upload your movie directly to Amazon, why in God's green earth would you stay with a company that's going to go bankrupt and God knows when you'll ever be able to get your money back for exposure. Are you absolutely kidding me? (laughs) Exposure? Then put it up on YouTube if you want exposure, man. That is ridiculous. It's archaic thinking. It's a dinosaur who said that. I'm sorry. And I, I get really upset about it. I get really passionate about it because that is horrible advice. There's so many other options out there for filmmakers to actually generate some revenue with their films, even if it's $20 a month. Even if it's $50 a month, there's always a way to make some sort of revenue off of your movie, even if your movie is 10 years old. You can go to a company like Film Hub and put it up directly. You can go to Indie Rights. You can go to uh, many other distributors. You know that are There's a handful of good ones out there. There's not many, but there's a handful of good ones out there who are honest and, and, and can work on it. And worst case scenario, you can go with another aggregator, which we can talk about that whole debacle in a minute as well. But that's another option. If you don't want to spend the money, an option like Film Hub or Indie Rights is an excellent option for filmmakers. You know, and Indie Rights uh, does curate while Film Hub accepts all movies because they're just a straight 80-20 deal. So if you don't have to worry about your film not getting accepted and it'll be thrown out on every single platform for free. You get an, it's an 80-20 split. So to, 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 to propose the idea that you can, oh, just keep it up there for exposure. Oh, go F yourself, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I mean, we're in 2019, man. This is, this is not the olden world. I mean, this is something that's a lot. Uh, things have changed a lot. And, I, and anybody who gives that kind of advice, please, anybody listening, do not 
only, oh, I just want exposure. You want exposure, put it up on Amazon yourself, and at least you can get paid for your exposure. Even if it's little, it's something. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you did mention uh, today on your uh, Facebook video that mm -hmm. this could happen again. This could happen to other aggregators. It will happen. Yeah. It will happen again. We're going we're gonna to be back here again, man. There's no question. Look, Deluxe, the one of the largest post-production companies in the world, just filed for bankruptcy. And when I say they're one of the biggest, they have almost a billion dollars in assets. But the problem is they owe between one and $10 billion. This is how large of a company. This is a massive company. And they just filed for bankruptcy. So if a company like Deluxe, which is this massive institution, Deluxe has been around for decades upon decades, what do you think is going to happen when a bad economic turn happens? Or let's say tomorrow, and this is what I've said publicly as well, is there's five basic, five approved aggregators that all of these platforms force, force everybody to go through. They force them to go through. Like this is, if I made a deal, if I sold a movie to Netflix right now, they would send me to go digital. Not anymore, probably, but they would have sent me to go digital. And they're like, look, that's going to be the deal. You're going to use them. Uh, we'll pay for the, the the cost. We'll include it in the deal, but we have to use aggregator. And then we're going to send the check to the aggregator and the aggregator is going to send it to you. What the hell is that about? The aggregator is just a, a service company. They shouldn't be responsible for dispersing funds. They don't have any rules. They don't have any oversight. There's no fiduciary responsibility. There's nothing in place to protect our money, period, from any aggregator. This is all of the big boys as well. Premier Digital, BitMax, none of them. I'm not saying that they might not self-regulate. I know Premier says that they have an escrow account and and it's separate and blah, 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 blah. That's great, but there are no rules. There is no oversight and we're talking about millions and millions of dollars, not just going to the independent filmmaker, but to mid-level distributors, as well as the large distributors. All the major studios go through these aggregators. Premier Digital has all the major studio accounts. So I'm going to throw up a, a, um, a what if at you. Let's say tomorrow that Disney, Paramount, Lionsgate, and Warner Brothers wakes up and says, you know what? We're just going to start setting up our own thing. We're going to go direct to these platforms. We're tired of dealing with uh, Premier Digital. And, and uh, you know, they're a little slow with their payments. I don't know. We just want to do it ourselves. It's just going to make a lot, life a lot easier for us. You mean to tell me that all these platforms wouldn't say, of course, mm -hmm. Warner Brothers, of course, Disney, will let you set up a direct access to us because they're that big. They're monsters. They're giants, right? So let's say tomorrow that all those four accounts walk away from these from this aggregator. All that money is gone. And we're talking about millions of dollars worth of transcoding fees and, and, and placements and all the stuff that they pay to get this stuff up there, right? Do you think that these platforms, are these, these aggregators are going to survive that? No. Do you think so? No. Right. So then what happens? They go down. And what happens again? We're all, we're all left holding the bag again. Because we might not have a voice individually as independent filmmakers using these platforms okay but as the studios definitely have a voice because they're the they're the they're the 800 pound gorillas we're nothing we're the banana peel you know we're in this in this scenario we're the banana peels being stepped on <laughs> in many ways so what do you think our chances are of ever getting our money back we're seeing it happen right now with go digital go digital was not go digital distributor was not one of the largest aggregators but they were not a they were not chump change, you know. There was millions of dollars that was run through that company, not only in service fees, but of payments. We're talking about millions upon millions of dollars that got funneled through that company for payments over the last eight years. The 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 what we found out is that they they probably had around four thousand filmmakers in their in their uh, in their library, if you will, that they're dealing with over four thousand filmmakers plus probably tens of thousands of films or projects and shows and things like that that they had to deal with. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. This whole model is ridiculous. And you have to ask yourself the question, are the platforms liable? Are the platforms responsible for any of this crap that's happening right now with distributor? If Netflix told us 
that, hey, this is one of two companies that you have to go through to do business with us. And you're forcing us to do business with this company. And you're also forcing us to accept them as our payment option. Not you, but them. Do you feel that there's any responsibility that's thrown on top of these platforms? I'm asking. Uh, yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, look at the, it's just insane. I mean, if Amazon can figure it out, because Amazon allows filmmakers to put movies up, and I, I get it. Look, I'm not saying that every single, uh, you know, I don't think Netflix should be allowing 10,000 filmmakers to upload their movies to them. I get that. Use an aggregator for that. It's called a service company. They're just a glorified post-production company. That's what they are. But then send your money directly to me. Send Set up accounts where money could be direct, direct, direct deposit into my accounts, or into my bank account, or do a PayPal transfer, or whatever it is. The technology is fairly simple and can be done. It could be done very easily by these massive platforms with massive amounts of resources. So if you want to still use the aggregators for the service, fine. I get it. That makes perfect sense. I would rather use one. Ag- I would rather, you know, submit once to one company and let them deal with, su- you know, supplying them to all these aggregators. I get that. But there should be a service. It's a service contract. It's the equivalent of me going to a post-production house, paying them to edit the movie, and then they saying, okay, from now on, we're going to accept all the money that comes in. That makes no sense. You're a service company. You're not a financial institution, and I'm not even making a direct deal with you. You're a middleman. You're a middleman that's a service provider. You know, it's 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 an insane system that was set up when the whole streaming things came up. iTunes was, I think, the first company that Apple was the first one that that demanded that people use aggregators, and then they chose these five, you know, the powerful five to do uh, to accept it, and then everybody else kind of piggybacked off of that. So the system is broken. And if we don't fix it now, we will be back here again. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to sound the alarm a little bit, but you know, we're trying to to really bring out attention to this problem because it's not just a problem about, oh, it's filmmakers and it's a distribu- it's a it's an aggregator, and that's the end of the deal. That's not the end of the deal. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And if we don't turn the ship, we will sink. We will crash and we will sink, man. And the writing is on the wall. I mean, everything I just laid out to you, it makes perfect sense. I hope, or am I, or am I just rambling X File fan? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, <laughs> that, you've, you know, we're just gonna, you know, they, <laughs> yeah. You've really been on the forefront of this issue and brought this out into public. And uh, I don't think we'd be talking about it today if you hadn't have been um, out there and talking about it week after week. A new article in Variety yesterday, or a couple of days ago now. Um, yeah, IndieWire is coming out with their new. IndieWire is going to be doing a huge one. It's going to come out either today or later Saturday or Monday. But I was told it's going to come out today, so hopefully it will be out today. And that one's supposedly a really deep, uh, deep dive into this, uh, into this whole problem because I honestly believe that this is a little Lehman Brothers for us, mm-hmm. for our industry. Yeah. It's it's the sign, like when a company like Distributor goes down. It's something that really should you should really look at again. When a company like Deluxe goes bankrupt in a really good economic time, there has to, you have to ask yourself, well, what's happening? Are these the are these the early signs of something that's going to come down the pike? Is this early signs of something coming around the corner? I believe it is, and I've like I said in my podcast earlier. I do believe that we're going to have an economic downturn. We're due. We're late. It happens every eight. It's cyclical. Every eight years, every 10 years, there's a bubble. There's a pop. There's an economic downturn. There's a recession. Something happens. We're late. It is historical. There's already indicators stating that something's coming. So I'm trying to warn my community, which is filmmakers. I'm like, guys, it's not going to be as hunky-dory as it is now. And if you think it's tough right now, Try to do what you're doing right now in 2008 or worse. You know, I remember 2008. Money dried up. Movies stopped being made. Independent films were just like everything which went away. And distrib- And then we were also in the middle of this whole streaming thing at the time. Yeah. We're like, what's this streaming thing that people keep talking about? You know, 
AFM this year is going to be smaller than it was last year because the, the, the times, they are a changing. And filmmakers got to really prepare themselves. You know, I'm very passionate about this because, you know, my tribe, which are independent filmmakers, is, is very vulnerable. They're a very vulnerable group. You know, we're artists. We're, we're people that want to create art and put our stuff out there and entertain people. Most filmmakers aren't businessmen or businesswomen. They don't understand the, the business side of show business, nor do they care about marketing or do they care about markets and how the market's moving or how platforms are changing or how the, the, we, the way we exhibit films are changing constantly. They're not on the cusp of all that stuff and they're very vulnerable to whatever schlocky guy that shows up, you know, slippery car salesman that shows up like, oh, come over here, I'll take care of you. That is where the predatory film distributor was born. It's, it's almost... It's almost, um, what's it called? It's like an iconic image of the, when you think film distributor, do you think of an honest guy? <laughs> it's like when you think of a car salesman, do you think of an honest guy? It's, it, it's, such, a, it's, it's such a myth now that you know, it, they become a mythical character. You know, when you find a good, a good film distributor, which there are out there, they're unicorns. They're so rare that it's impossible to believe that they exist. You know, so we can talk about Predatory distributors as well. That's another fun topic I'd love to talk about. But that's uh, that's what we, but that's what's going on with with this this whole distributor debacle. So you have Indie Film Hustle, the podcast, and you also have Indie Film Hustle TV, and you have a new book coming out. You want to tell us a little bit about that? And we'll have you back on the show yeah, so in a few weeks to talk more about that too. By the way, I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. I I have a book called Rise of the Film Entrepreneur: How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money Making Business. And I have a brand new website that's called filmtrepreneur.com. Or if you want to get to it easier, it's just called um, um, filmmakingbusiness.com. It gets you there as well. It's a quick hack to get there if you don't know how to spell filmtrepreneur, which I don't blame you. <laughs> but the but I have a new podcast with that, a new website, a new YouTube channel, uh, and wow. a new book. And, the, and basically what I wanted to do with this new platform is to start focusing on the business side. Like I say, I'm putting the business back into show business because – so many filmmakers are only thinking about the show, but they do not think about the business. And when you don't think about the business or don't understand the business or don't care to learn about the business, you will not survive. And what I lay out in the Film Entrepreneur uh, book is the Film Entrepreneur Method, which is how to generate multiple revenue streams from your independent film projects and either series or films. And that the main resource, the main source of your income doesn't have to be the exploitation of the movie. It could be from all of these other ancillary products that are aimed at a specific niche. And I show, I, I, I talk about multiple case studies in the book and it already hit number one on Amazon and in the pre-order space, which I was like blown away within a day after I released it, it went to number one wow. because filmmakers are hungry for this information. So that book's coming out November 7th. If you want to pre-order the book, just go to filmbizbook.com. Filmbizbook.com takes you to um, to the uh, Amazon page. And that way uh, you can jump on it beforehand. It will be available in paperback. It will be available in audiobook as well or at the same time or soon thereafter. But it's something I'm really, really passionate about because I do truly believe that the future of independent filmmaking is not going to be what we see today. It is going to be film entrepreneurs. It's going to be people who, filmmakers who are entrepreneurial in nature and upper, entre, think about their filmmaking in an entrepreneurial way because that's the only thing that's going to help you withstand economic downturns or the, the industry changing. Our, our business is changing so rapidly every day. What was true six months ago is not true today. What's hot now wasn't hot six years ago. You know, so like when iTunes, two years ago, iTunes, you can make money on as an independent filmmaker with transactional. Transactional is pretty much dead for independent filmmaking. Now the money is being made in, in SVOD and AVOD, subscription like Amazon Prime or Tubi for advertising-based uh, uh, films. And people are like, I don't want to put my film up for free. Well, then you're an idiot <laughs> because that's where the money is. I hate to tell you that's where the money is. Can certain movies make money with transactional if they have an audience and they can push it for the first 30 days? Absolutely. But for a lot of other films that don't have that kind of audience or their older titles, let's say, put them up on SVOD as soon as possible. 
put them up on, on AVOD as soon as possible. That is where the future is, I think, for the streaming, the streaming world. I don't think people are going to be paying or renting anymore. That concept of renting or purchasing a movie is an older concept that's held over from the video store days. And this is somebody who worked in a video store for five years in high school. So I'm very well aware of that model. Before, before video stores, no one bought movies. No one rented movies. The concept is a holdover from the video store days. And it's still for a certain generation it is, but do you think the generations coming up behind me and you are going to rent? Probably not. It's not a concept that they're really used to. They're used to getting it for free, streaming it as part of a, a, a subscription model or so on and so forth, or watching it now for free with advertising involved. So it is the world is changing so much that if you're able to create a business around your movie, which doesn't rely on the exploitation of the movie alone and you can create multiple revenue streams, that is, I feel, the key to being a successful filmmaker. And if you're able to do it once, twice, three, four, five movies, now you have a portfolio and you have multiple multiple revenue streams coming in from all of those films. And guess what? Now you've become a mini Disney. In a, in, an independent Disney is basically what the, the model is. Because, because Walt Disney Company is still making money every single day on Snow White. Snow White was released in 1937. George Lucas is still making money. Well, not maybe him, but Disney's now making money. Uh, from Star Wars, released in 1977, every single day, every hour of every day, Somewhere in the world, someone's buying a t-shirt, a hat, a, a, a lunchbox, something. So that's how we have to start thinking about our independent films. And I lay out a complete method and battle and blueprint on how to do that. So that is what the book is about. That's what the new platform is about as well. Because I really want to empower independent filmmakers to take control of their own destinies and not rely on these hucksters, these snake oil salesmen that you run into and with these predatory deals that are 15 years that are you know hundred thousand dollar marketing caps if you even get a marketing cap they want the ip they want to have add their names on as executive producers it's just all it's all bullshit it's just all absolute bs it really really is so i i want to empower filmmakers and as you can hear it in my voice i'm fairly passionate about this yeah a little bit <laughs> a little bit <laughs> so the book is called rise of the film entrepreneur and, uh, yeah, just entrepreneur, but film entrepreneur. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, Alex, thanks for joining us today. We're big fans of what you do, and we'll definitely have to have you back soon. Yeah, cool. And can I can I say one sure, more thing? Yeah. I also have uh, my boot camp coming up. I, uh, that's oh, yeah. coming up in a few weeks. So I'd love to, uh, to talk about it if I could, because mm -hmm. I'm a hustler, so I have to. I'll take every advantage I can, sir. <laughs> um, so I have a I have a boot camp called the Make Your Movie Boot Camp, which is a two day intensive that teaches you everything you need to know about how to make a low-budget feature film, even all the way down to a micro-budget feature film, taking you from conception all the way to actually generating revenue with your movie. And I create a whole plan on how to do it. I've done it multiple times myself. I use case studies. I even have special guests coming in to talk about it. And it's at the. It's going to be held in Burbank, October 26th and 27th. It's a live. Uh, it's going to be a live workshop. It won't be online anywhere. It's not going to be simulcast. It's an exclusive elite program and if you want to sign up for it it's at mym so make your movie or mymbootcamp.com alex ferrari thanks for joining us thank you brother for having me i appreciate it man <laughs> thanks so that's alex ferrari we thank alex for joining us on the podcast so so there you have it now you're up to date uh distributor is closing uh, still no official word about that, but it's looking pretty clear that it's mm -hmm. time to take your films down and uh, and apparently the the ease of putting it somewhere else and uh, keeping all the reviews intact. Uh, it's, it's looking like it's possible. That's good news. And you know what? And if you want to leave it up there, I say go for it. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, controversy. I just controversy. think. I don't know. Well. So Everybody can have points. their opinion, but now we know, see, now we know that in nine months there will be no more. So true. And then they'll be doing nothing. If you're filming, you won't be them. able to have it taken down at all. So yeah, then, then you'll be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for us, for all the research behind the scenes. 
You're <laughs> welcome, Jeffrey. <laughs> I showed up. <laughs> yeah, uh, good. You did all. All right, Jeffrey. Sorry, I wasn't able to help Jeffrey with these interviews too much this time. <laughs> Sorry. Shame on me. Shame on. Wait till winter comes and it gets harder. Oh no, the the uh, snow plowing. Okay, I, I, the snow plowing. People yeah. out in California are like, what's snow? Yeah. It's a, it's this stuff that controls my life in the winter time. <laughs> By the way, I do want to mention that we apologize to Heather Hale. We do have an interview with her, and it's been it has been preempted by this breaking news for the past couple of weeks. Uh, Heather Hale, the author of Story Selling. Yeah. Uh, so we will have that interview for you in uh, in the coming weeks. So we do want to apologize for uh, putting that on hold. Yeah, because hopefully she won't this. be mad at us. And, <laughs> yeah, and, hopefully. And, you know, because I'd love to have her back on. She's awesome. Yeah. She's a she was a super nice person. Get Real Indie Filmmakers is a production of Borges Networks, 2019.